Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about exactly what we're supposed to be doing to celebrate the Feast of Passover. Now, leading up to this day, I have produced videos and done classes showing you how keeping the Feast of Passover will prevent you from getting plagues like the coronavirus. That's over in Jubilees chapter 49 and verse 15. And I've shown you how the regathering that we hear about in the New Testament will take place on the Feast of Passover. That's in the Septuagint translation of the book of Jeremiah in chapter 38. From the general epistle of Barnabas in chapter 8, I showed you how the construction of the third temple will begin on the Feast of Passover. And from Revelation chapter 7 and verse 14, we showed you that the 144,000 are those that would be washed in the Lamb, which occurs during Passover. From the book called Second Esdras, I showed you how the 144,000 will be sealed during the Lord's Feast. And based on what we saw in Jeremiah, we believe that that's also talking about the Feast of Passover. And from the book of John, chapter 6, we showed you how the Feast of Passover is related to eternal life. In other words, keeping the Feast of Passover is necessary to receive eternal life, we saw in verse 54. And in the book of Matthew, in chapter 26, we've shown you how the communion festival of Passover is associated with the marriage supper or the kingdom of heaven. And in this video, we're going to be telling you exactly what you're supposed to be doing to fulfill the requirements of Passover. So, get your pencil and your piece of paper out. Be prepared to take notes because there is a lot of information to cover and I will be trying to cover it as quickly as possible. Go ahead and hit the like button and be prepared to leave a comment as we go. This video is brought to you by Coach and Advice Celestial Clock Calendar. The world's first quartz clock that is an accurate visual representation of our Father's heavenly sacred calendar. So let me tell you about this celestial clock calendar. This clock displays the sacred year by indicating the periods of the celestial elements of our heavenly Father's sacred calendar. Inspired by Holy Scripture like Genesis 1 verse 14, this new timepiece measures days by counting hours of the solar day. It measures the seasons by counting the days of lunation. It measures the year by counting the periods the sun travels through the stargates or the portals of Enoch. The days of remembrance keep the calendar in sync with the sacred celestial calendar by regulating the timing of the sacred moons. The clock precisely estimates sunset times when set to local standard time. Accuracy is achieved when the sun hand is set to the local sunset time. This calendar predicts the days of remembrance, new moon days, Sabbath days, and feast days by indicating the days of the month. And since it measures the sun's transit through the stargates, it can indicate equinoxes, equiluxes, and solstices. To use the clock calendar, simply set the hour hand to the day of the year, set the minute hand to the day of the month, and set the second hand to the hour, the included AA battery, quartz jewel, and time do the rest. Get more information about the clock in the description of this video or send me an email to endthefight at yahoo.com. Now, when we look in Leviticus chapter 23, which is where you see information on all of the feast days in one chapter, down in verse 5, we start to hear about the 14th day of the first month, which is the Lord's Passover. And then you see it goes on to start talking about the 15th day of the month, which begins the week-long Feast of Unleavened Bread. But it is back over in Exodus chapter 12 that we first start hearing about the Feast of Passover in the 14th day of the month. But there we also hear about what we're supposed to do on the 10th day. That's the day that our father was talking to Moses about in verse 3 of chapter 12 when he said that we were to go out and choose a lamb for our Passover meal. It is on the 10th day of the month that we are to choose that lamb. But before we go on, let's come back over to Matthew chapter 21, where we see what happened on the 10th day of the month back there during the Messiah's time. That is the day in which they chose him, the Messiah, as the Lamb. 
It was on the 10th day of the month that he rode in on the back of a donkey with everybody singing Hosanna. And it was also on that day that he went into the temple and turned over the money changers. When we come over to the third testament of the Bible in chapter 11, we see in verse 98 that it is confirming what we read over there in Matthew. And that is that the Messiah actually replaced the lamb. Many of us who raise animals would actually slaughter a lamb or a goat on Passover. But now we are only actually doing so for food and not to represent the Christ. So how do we reconcile this, what we're reading back over here in the book of Exodus chapter 12? When the Messiah has stood in for the lamb. Well, we learn back over in Matthew in chapter 26 that our father has replaced the blood of the lamb or the blood of the goats with the communion wine that we drink on Passover. Let me bring you back over to the third testament of the Bible in chapter 14 and verse 33. You see where it says, Today I allow you to remember the bread and the wine with which I represented my body and my blood. We are actually supposed to be having the communion festival on Passover, just like the Messiah did with his disciples. But while we're over here in the Third Testament, let me show you some other verses. Like, for instance, over here in verse 102 out of chapter 11, almost halfway through the verse, it says, If I took the bread and wine, it was to make you understand that they were the love that is the sustenance of the Spirit. And if I told you, do this in memory of me, the Master wished to tell you to love your brothers with a love like that of the Messiah giving yourselves as the true sustenance of humanity so in other words now as we're just now remembering or realizing that we are supposed to be doing communion on passover we're learning from this verse and some of the others that we'll see that the bread and the wine are only symbols of the communion of passover let's look at another verse from chapter 14 where he is also talking about abolishing the required Passover sacrifice there in verse 35. He's saying that during his time, if he abolished the sacrificial lamb, it is during this time that he's making us aware that his body and his blood would no longer be represented by bread and wine. He says in verse 36, every spirit who wishes to live will have to be nourished from the divine spirit. He who listens to my word and fills it within his heart has truly been nourished. He has not only been fed by my body and drank of my blood, but he also has taken from the spirit to nourish himself. So what he is saying is that the bread element of the Passover communion symbolizes the word of God. And this all makes sense when you think about it. In the first arrow back there with Moses, the word of God. It was Moses that was actually writing it down at the time. So the Passover celebration was represented by a lamb and its blood. Then in the second era, before the New Testament has started to be written, the elements of Passover were changed from the lamb and its blood to bread and wine. Because even though the Old Testament had been written at the time, it was not available to the common man. Unless you were a priest or worked down at the temple, you probably never saw Holy Scripture in your life. It is only now, after the year 1611, when Scripture has become available to anybody who wants it, do we now have the Word of God in our hands? Well, we no longer have to represent the Word of God with the bread or with the lamb. This verse is telling us that listening to his word and filling it in our heart is the actual nourishment of the Passover. We see over in chapter 4 and verse 6 that the Passover communion festival is spiritual. We also see that in chapter 14 and verse 31 where he's talking about the spiritual banquet where the divine master awaits to give us spiritual food and drink which is the bread and the wine of true life so how does this all work for me the Passover is represented by all three 
you have the lamb, the bread and the wine, as well as the scripture and the love for my brother, which I fulfill by praying for those who are in tribulation, those that are suffering from ailments, and the people who are dying in these war zones. All three of those elements make up the Passover festival. So what do we do on the 10th day of the month as we get ready for Passover? Some will be choosing a lamb, but like we said, that would only be for food. And others will be choosing the correct bottle of wine or grape juice and trying to find the unleavened bread, which I remind you is difficult to find. So some will actually just be getting their recipe together and acquiring the necessary ingredients to make their own bread. But I believe the main focus here is to be choosing the scripture in which you will read during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That is the choice to be made on the 10th day of the month. What scripture will you consume during that week of Unleavened Bread? Some of you who will be reading the scripture for the first time should choose the book of Proverbs. Then going on to the first five books of the Bible in the Old Testament or the Gospels in the New Testament. But others who have read the Bible will choose other books like the Third Testament of the Bible that we were just talking about. But the one that I would suggest is the book called The Shepherd of Hermas, which our channel is based on. You hear us talking about Hermas Academy. It is because the Shepherd of Hermas is the only book that gives us the tools we need in order to survive the tribulation. That's why you hear us say we teach virtues. Without those virtues, we will not make it into the kingdom of heaven, at least in this lifetime. And we can be sure that when we finally do make it to the kingdom of heaven, those that make it there before us will be sure to be teaching us the virtues that we learn from the Shepherd of Hermas. But let's come back over to Leviticus 23 and let's look at verse 6 when it's talking about the 15th day of the same month, which is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So now we've already established that this bread that he's talking about is the Word of God. So Let's understand what he's talking about, this unleavened part. We learn in Matthew in chapter 16 that when he's talking about leavening, he's talking about the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which today would be what we know as the doctrine of the church. And that's what he's telling us to avoid. So when we're told to get the leavening out of our house and to only consume unleavened bread, what we're being told is that for that week, we are only to consume the unadulterated word of God. That's the week when we will avoid church and church doctrine altogether, including books written by religious leaders or songs which usually have church doctrine interlaced in the lyrics and the pamphlets like the Daily Bread or those Jehovah Witness pamphlets and even YouTube videos like this one that is talking about the Word of God. No, for the week of unleavened bread we are to consume only the scripture for that entire week. That's the week in which we are to get back to the basics. Get back to what the scripture actually said without any leaven involved. Then notice right there in verse 7 it says that on the first day we should have a holy convocation and we should do no servile work. That's talking about a Sabbath day. Then let's look at verse 8 which says, But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord for seven days. For some people that offering made by fire will include entire cows or whole bulls that they will burn on an altar and others who our father has not provided a cow to make an offering with will take advantage of the grain offerings talked about in Leviticus chapter 2 but let me show you another option I believe we have over in Psalms chapter 141 and verse 2 where King David says let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense and the lifting up my hands as the evening sacrifice so for most of you, especially the ones this is your first Passover, 
should consider what David is asking here and that is that his lifted up arms and his prayers would be counted as his offering made by fire and you will do that for seven days and let me quickly show you some other verses that support this idea like for instance Psalms chapter 50 verse 14 which says offer unto God thanksgiving and Psalms chapter 116 verse 17 which says I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving so now is thanksgiving an acceptable offering to be made during this week well I hope so because many people see in this video this late in the game that will be the only thing that they will have to offer now let's look at Psalms chapter 51 verse 17 which says the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart and let's look at Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15 which says let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually so instead of us doing nothing and ignoring the offering made in verse 8 let's at least offer a contrite heart and a broken spirit along with our thanksgiving and praise and then you see that verse 8 goes on to say that the seventh day of the feast of our leavened bread is also a holy convocation so in closing let's summarize all of this the 14th day of the first month at evening which is the day that they will be slaughtering the lambs well this is the night that we'll be having the communion festival with the bread and the wine and I would suggest you read John chapter 6 in the ears of anybody participating in that festival with you and it is also on that day that you will remove all leavening from your house that includes breads and other products made with yeast baking soda and or baking powder which are all materialistic leavening but you'll also remove the religious documents from your house like books written by religious leaders and commentaries on the Bible and you will be sure to avoid any of that type of stuff including TV programs about scripture for the entire week of unleavened bread and according to verse 7 on the first day of the festival will be a holy convocation so that is the day that we'll need to get off work and during that week we'll make an offering like we talked about so for seven days with a broken spirit and a contrite heart we will be offering up thanksgiving and praise and on the seventh day of the festival we'll have another holy convocation so we'll get that day off work as well now I know this is overly simplified and for those who are further along in their spiritual walk please don't let me stop you from doing anything that you're used to doing on this festival that is not my intent to bring you backwards the audience of intent for this video is for those who never heard of Passover before and this will be their first time doing it and they really only want to meet the minimal requirements so if you have any questions or anything please put them down in the comment section below and may our father bless you and keep you may he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you may our father lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace